Shall we turn in our Bibles to Zechariah chapter 10 as we continue our journey through the Word? The nation of Israel has been a disappointment to God. He had called them and chosen them. He ordained through them to bring the Messiah into the world. He desired that they live in a relationship with him so that he could show to the world the blessings of a nation whose God is Jehovah. But they were always turning their backs on God. God sent the prophets to them with promises of blessing if they would only seek the Lord and with words of warning of the, desire, of the dire consequences of forsaking the Lord. And thus you'll find mixed promises with sort of threats or announcements of the consequences of taking the path you are on. Now, if you're on a, a path that is leading to destruction and people keep warning you, if you go down that path, you're going to be destroyed. Down that path, there lies real danger. There are snipers all around shooting at people that go by. So don't take that path. But if you ignore the warnings and you continue on that path, though all the way along they're warning you of the danger that lies down that path, when you get into that place of danger, you can't say it was the fault of the one that was warning you. Oh, you brought me into all of this danger. No, they warned you that this path will lead you to danger. You ignored them and you continued that path that leads to destruction. Now, there are many people today who are walking a path that leads to destruction. And God warns them of the destruction that is at the end of that road. If you persist going down the road, you can't blame God for what happens to you. God sought to turn you away from that path of destruction. He told you what awaited you down the path. But that's just because he knows where the path leads. And so it is wrong then to blame God for the calamity that comes upon a person's life when they choose to ignore the warnings of God. Now with the nation of Israel, they were taking a path that was leading to destruction. And God was warning them of the destruction that would come to the nation if they persisted in that path. But all the while, he was promising, if you'll just turn to me, I'll bless you. I'll be with you. I will prosper you. And calling them constantly to turn from the path of destruction to the path of life. Now what is true for the nation of Israel is true for us as individuals tonight. God is calling us and he gives us glorious promises. If you'll just follow me, if you'll just believe in Jesus Christ, this is what I will do for you. This is what the future will hold. Take my path, walk in my way, and this is where it will lead you. But he also warns, if you take the other path, it's going to lead to destruction. It's going to lead to uh, misery and sorrow, pain. So... You find mixed promises of blessing with mixed warnings of, of calamity uh, in the prophets. And, and so here in chapter 10, it begins with sort of a promise. 
if you'll just seek the Lord. Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain. So the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. In Israel, they have the, what they call former rains that come in the autumn equinox. They begin about now. And they have these former rains that uh, sort of bring the winter grass. And then they have usually a season of, of uh, beautiful winter weather. But then towards the uh, spring equinox, they have what they call the latter rains in the good years. Now, most of the farming used to be uh, what they call dry farming. And in much of Israel today, especially around the area of Bethlehem and uh, west of Bethlehem, and south of Bethlehem, they still are what you call dry farmers. They put out their tomato plants uh, in the uh, early uh, part of, of, actually, the, well, it would be the latter part of the winter, and then they hope for the spring rains. And when they have spring rains, they have great tomato crops. If they don't get them, they have little dried, shriveled tomatoes. Uh, but they depend upon the rain. They, 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 have to, they have to just really seek for that rain. So ask ye of the Lord, rain in the time of the latter rain. And the Lord will make bright clouds. And he'll give them showers of rain to everyone, grass in the field. The same with the wheat seed. It goes out in the, in the early rains and and then sort of sets there, and then in the latter rain, it just really brings the weed out to the full uh, blossom and the, and the uh, uh, whatever they call the, he the heads or whatever it is of wheat. <laughs> but at any rate, the idols have spoken vanity. Now, you see, right in this prom uh, promise and all, ask for rain and so forth, the idols have spoken vanity. Um, the word there is the teraphim, and uh, they were thought to be life-size type of idols. Now, in those days, they had what they called speaking idols, and uh, they were called oracles. Uh, there was the oracle of Adelphi in uh, Greece, and uh, these noted oracles, the temples to these various gods where there was the statue and supposedly you go and uh, the uh, gods speak through these oracles. And so the teraphim have spoken vanity, uh, these supposed voices of God from these idols. And the diviners have seen a lie and they have told false dreams. And thus they comfort in vain. Therefore they went their way as a flock. They were troubled because there was no shepherd. People seeking after guidance for their lives. Seeking to find the answers from fortune tellers, diviners, from these oracles. Without real guidance, no shepherd. And so God said, my anger was kindled against the shepherds and I punished the goats. For the Lord of hosts has visited his flock, the house of Judah, the flock of God, and he hath made them as his goodly horse in battle. Now out of him, that is out of Judah, and it is future tense, cometh forth the corner. Out of him, the nail. Out of Judah will come the cornerstone, actually. In Isaiah 28, verse 6, he prophesies concerning uh, the cornerstone that was coming. 
And Peter quotes this uh, particular uh, verse in his epistle. Ah, I got the wrong reference. Let's see here. I'll, I'll get it. <laughs> 16, all right. I, I made my own little notes here in the margin, and I... Got the wrong, I put a one in front of that. Just wait a minute, I'll get it there. Thank you. <laughs> 28, 16, you're right. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, and he that believeth shall not make haste. God's promise. So out of Judah, the tribe of Judah, will come this stone. Out of him, the nail. Back in Isaiah again, chapter 22, verses 23 and 24. Uh, I, and Isaiah speaks of this nail. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open, and I will fasten him as a nail in a sure place. And he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house, and they shall hang upon him all of the glory of his father's house. The offspring and the issue, all vessels of small quantity, from the vessels of cups even to all of the vessels of flagons. So uh, then in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall the nail that is fastened in the sure place be removed. Christ was crucified and be cut down and fall. But the burden that was upon it shall be cut off. That is the nation of Israel for the Lord has spoken it. So this nail was uh, the pegs that they put in the wall upon which they hung their pots and, and the various things within the house. And so God is declaring that out of Judah will come this uh, one upon which the, the, the nation will uh, be hung, actually. Out of him the battle bow. And out of him every oppressor together. And they shall be as mighty men, which tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets in the battle. And they shall fight because the Lord is with them, and the riders on horses shall be confounded. And I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph, or the northern kingdom of Israel, Ephraim, and I will bring them again to place them, for I have mercy upon them, and they shall be as though I had not cast them off, for I am the Lord their, their God and will hear them. So the promise that God is going to bring them again back to the land. Now as we move into this portion, especially as we get into chapter 12, uh, we're going to read much of the promise of God in the bringing of the people back and establishing the nation of Israel again. So as we get into these prophecies, these are things that are happening before our eyes, things that are taking place now in the earth. Uh, and, and our newspapers are full of uh, the things that are going on in the nation of Israel as right now they're in this peace process, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll look at that a little more fully in chapter 12. But the promise that he was going to place them again in the land, have mercy upon them, and they'll be as though they were never cast out. Uh, God's grace and goodness. Uh, oh, he is so good. He is so gracious. He is so merciful. Though we fail, though we sin, he is always has his arms outstretched to receive us back as his children, to place us in the family as though we were never cast out. 
as though we never left. The story that Jesus gave of the prodigal son who took the inheritance, went out and wasted it, and when he finally came to himself in that miserable condition of feeding the pigs and eating the corn husk that he was throwing to the pigs, he said, this is stupid. My dad has servants that live much better than this. I would be better off as just a servant in my dad's house than to be out here destitute like this. I'm going to go home. I'll ask my dad to forgive me. I know that I'm not worthy to be called his son again, but that's all right. If I can just be his servant, I'll have a much better job than feeding these pigs and eating the husk here. So as he headed home, it says his father saw him afar off and came running. Oh, the grace of God. And here with the nation of Israel, they will be as though I never cast them off. As God will again bless them and and acknowledge them. And they of Ephraim, the northern kingdom, shall be like a mighty man. And their heart shall rejoice as through wine. Yea, their children shall see it and be glad. And their heart shall rejoice in the Lord. There, There will be that again turning to God and that glorious reunion as as the prodigal comes home and the father receives them. And I will whistle, hiss is sort of a whistle in which you are calling. I'll whistle for them and gather them for I have redeemed them and they shall increase as they have increased. So glorious promises of the future. But Then the judgments that await them, I will sow them among the people and they shall remember me in far countries and they shall live with their children and turn again. And I will bring them again also out of the land of Egypt and gather them out of Assyria. I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon and place place shall not be found for them. They'll come back in such numbers that Uh, It'll be hard to uh, repopulate them. And that's exactly what's happening now as uh, Russia has opened the door and allowed so many Jews to come back to Israel uh, that uh, it's just growing so rapidly it's uh, difficult to get them all placed. Uh, and And he shall pass through the sea with affliction and shall smite the waves of the sea and all the deeps of the river shall dry up and the pride of Assyria shall be brought down, and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away. This, of course, is is yet future. God, as he establishes his kingdom, bringing the Jews back into the land, and uh, the powers of Assyria, the powers of Egypt, will be taken. And I will strengthen them in the Lord, and they shall walk up and down in his name, saith the Lord. So, Now the judgment is going to come uh, in the latter days. As Israel is gathered back into the land, uh, they are still to experience the judgment of God. Uh, Open thy doors, O Lebanon, that fire, the fire may devour thy cedars. Uh, The armies that came against Jerusalem usually came from the north, And they came down through Lebanon. Uh, When the Roman armies came against uh, Jerusalem, uh, they actually came through Lebanon and down into the upper Galilee region. And they first conquered the area of the Galilee with tremendous slaughter. And then they moved on and set siege against Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Uh, Josephus, in his Wars of the Jews, gives graphic details of the horrible siege of Jerusalem and how that gangs began to rove the streets and rule the city. Uh, There was a total breakdown of law and order. And uh, if anybody had food, 
uh, these roving gangs would kill them and gangs were fighting against gangs and there was looting and robbing and Josephus said more Jews were killed by other Jews than were being killed by the Romans as uh, this horrible anarchy uh, broke out in Jerusalem. So uh, open the doors, Lebanon, that the fire may devour your cedars. Howl the fir trees, for the cedar is fallen, because the mighty are spoiled. Howl ye oaks of Bashan, for the forest of the vintage has come down. There is a voice of howling of the shepherds, for their glory is spoiled. A voice of the roaring of the young lions, for the pride of Jordan is spoiled. Thus saith the Lord my God, feed the flock of the slaughter, or feed them to the slaughter, whose possessors slay them and hold themselves not guilty when they are captured by the Roman troops. Uh, there will be no guilt feelings, though there was such a horrible slaughter. Over a million Jews in Jerusalem were slaughtered in 70 A.D., when Titus took the city. But the possessors who slay them hold themselves not guilty, and they that sell them, the Jews that did survive, were taken back to be sold as slaves. And they that sell them will say, Blessed be the Lord, I'm rich. And their own shepherds will not even pity them. For I will no more pity the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord, but lo, I will deliver the man every one of, into his neighbor's hand and into the hand of the king that they shall smite the land and out of their hand I will not deliver them. So I'm going to allow them to come and capture the people. I'm not going to deliver them. And of course we get to the reason why God allows the Romans to come in and so devastate the land. For I will feed the flock of slaughter, or to the slaughter, even you, O poor of the flock. And I took unto me two staves, or two staffs, uh, shepherd staffs. The one I called beauty, and the other I called bands. And I fed the flock. Three shepherds also I cut off in one month, and my soul loathed them, and their soul also abhorred me. Now commentators have searched to try to find where three shepherds were cut off in one month and there is no historic evidence for this. And so it is thought that it was a reference to uh, the leaders, uh, the high priest, uh, the rulers of the Jews, uh, and the governors who were cut off uh, when Rome conquered the land. Then I said, I will not feed you that that dieth let it die. And that that is to be cut off, let it be cut off. And let the rest eat every one the flesh of another. And this was literally fulfilled in the siege. According to Josephus says, uh, they turned to cannibalism finally within the city uh, because they were so hungry as a result of that horrible siege. And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder. Of course, that staff beauty is Jesus Christ, who was crucified, cut off, cut asunder, that I might break my covenant, which I had made with all the people. God said, I will be your God. You will be my people. I will bless you. Uh, but this covenant was broken. And so the staff called beauty, representing the covenant that God had made, to send them a Messiah and all. That was broken, and the staff was cut asunder. And it was broken in that day, so that the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. That faithful remnant, even the disciples, they knew uh, God's word. And I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, cast it unto the potter, a goodly price that I was prized of at them, by them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver, cast them unto the potter in the house of the Lord. 
We know that Judas came to the high priest and he made a bargain with them to betray Jesus to reveal his whereabouts for 30 pieces of silver. And they measured out to him or weighed out to him 30 pieces of silver. And Judas led the guards of the high priest to the Garden of Gethsemane where he knew Jesus would go and pray with his disciples. And he had told them, the one that I kiss, the same one is he. Hold him fast. And so Judas came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And they grabbed Jesus and he turned to Judas and he said, Betrayest thou me with a kiss? Now, there are a lot of explanations that are being offered as far as Judas is concerned. There are those who would like to sort of exonerate him or make his culpable um, deed less onerous. They say that Judas was just trying to force Jesus to show his power and to uh, reveal himself as the Messiah. He was tired of waiting. Uh, he wanted to get the show on the road. He was anxious to see the glory and the power and all. Uh, and so he was, he was just trying to speed things up by betraying Jesus because he thought that Jesus would reveal his power and uh, that uh, the kingdom would come. And that when he saw that Jesus was yielding and submitting to the cross, he realized that uh, the whole thing had blown up and, and uh, that's what caused his remorse and taking the money back to the priest. Uh, we do know that when um, he saw that Jesus was crucified, he went back with the money and brought it back to the priest and uh, returned or sought to return the money to them. And he said, I betrayed innocent blood. And they more or less said, that's your problem. You'll have to deal with it. And so we can't take the money back. It's blood money. It was used to purchase blood. And so uh, we can't take it back. And so Judas threw it down there on the floor of the temple and he went out and hanged himself. And they then said, we can't put it back in the treasury. What will we do with it? And it was decided that they would buy a potter's field. And so the prophecy of Zechariah was literally fulfilled. Matthew, as he writes about it, uh, makes reference to a prophecy of Jeremiah being fulfilled. But actually the prophecy was of, from Zechariah. Now he said, as Jeremiah spoke, uh, maybe Jeremiah spoke this and Zechariah uh, was writing what he knew Jeremiah had spoken, but uh, here it is in Zechariah, uh, the 30 pieces of silver, the cost uh, that uh, Judas charged to betray the Lord. A goodly price I was prized to them. Under the law... If you had an ox and it gored your neighbor's servant to death, you would have to give your neighbor 30 pieces of silver to pay for his slave that he lost by your ox that gored him. And so Jesus was sold for the price of a slave gored by an ox um, a goodly price he said that I was prized of them uh, give it to the potter cast it down in the house of the Lord and so it was literally fulfilled and then I cut asunder my other staff even bands that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel and so this union 
between Judah and Israel also broken. Now he prophesies of a yet future event, the coming Antichrist who is called here the idle shepherd. And the Lord said unto me, Take unto thee yet the instruments of a foolish shepherd. For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land which shall not visit those that are cut off, neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still. But he shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear the claws or the hooves in pieces. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaves the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Now the Bible tells us about this man of sin that is going to come on the scene. He is called in the Bible by many different names. The son of perdition, the man of sin, the Antichrist, the beast. And he is going to be a world ruler, thought to rise up to lead the European community, the revived Roman Empire, and will actually as the leader of the European community will be a leader of the world and the world will come under his power and his authority. He will make a covenant with the nation of Israel. No doubt in that covenant, the peace process, for he comes as a man of peace. In that process, there will be the granting of the, to the Jews the right to rebuild their temple. And when this arrangement is made, the Jews will hail him as their Messiah. As Jesus said, I came in my Father's name, you did not receive me, but another is coming in his own name, and him you will receive. Interesting today that the Jews claim that they do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah because he claimed to be the Son of God. They say that the Messiah will not be the Son of God. He'll be a man, just a plain man like Moses. For Moses said, another prophet shall arise like, an un like unto me, and to him shall you give heed. So the Antichrist, I mean the uh, Messiah, uh, he is the Antichrist, but they said uh, the one they are going to hail will be the Antichrist, but they said he'll be a man. So ask them, how will you know him if he's just a man? And they'll say he will lead us to build our temple. And uh, thus they are looking now. And they are anticipating now the rebuilding of the temple. They are already preparing the instruments to use for the sacrifices in the temple. Uh, they are training the young uh, yeshiva students, 200 of them, uh, to take over the priestly duties. Uh, to, they're teaching them how to uh, butcher the animals for the sacrifices and all. And, and they are expecting uh, to have their temple soon. And uh, just waiting for the opportunity of the rebuilding of the temple. Now, when he makes, when the Antichrist or the false prophet, the idle shepherd here, or the foolish shepherd, uh, who they will receive, they rejected the true shepherd, they'll receive him, but he will not really care for them. He will not heal those that are sick. He'll not mend those that are broken, uh, but will just make this covenant with them. And after three and a half years, of this covenant, he will come to the rebuilt temple, he will profane it uh, by entering himself into the Holy of Holies, showing that he is God and demanding to be worshipped as God. There will be an assassination attempt against him. And uh, 
he will be wounded mortally. And uh, his miraculous recovery from this wound will cause the whole world to look with awe upon him. Um, now here in Zechariah, that's in chapter 13 of Revelation where it speaks about his mortal wound and his recovery from this deadly wound. Uh, but here Zechariah tells us a, a little bit more about the wounding of him. Uh, the sword will be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm will be dried up. His right eye shall be utterly darkened. So as a result of the assassination attempt, he will lose the use of his right arm and no doubt be blinded in the right eye. And so um, this, if you're around, is one of the things you can look for, but uh, <laughs> don't look for me. <laughs> Paul the Apostle tells us that that which hinders will hinder until it is taken out of the way and then shall the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. As long as the influence of the Holy Spirit is in the world, in the church, the Antichrist cannot be revealed. Uh, his powers cannot be manifested. They're going to have to get rid of us first. And uh, it's interesting that uh, the New Age movement have classified us as, as um, expendable. We've got to go before they can really inaugurate this global world government, the global peace, the global economy. You are the ones that are standing in the way of this global mobilization. And uh, they've already declared that it's the fundamentalist Christians that are the greatest threat to this global peace that they're seeking to bring about and have declared that they'll have to do something about us first. Well, the Lord will do something about us before they get a chance. Uh, he's going to take us out of here. So I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I, I really, uh, I think he is in the world today. I think he's probably one of the prominent figures in the world today. Um, I believe that the time... We're living in that time, I do believe, where he will soon be revealed. Uh, I think that we're at that point of, of the culmination of the historic events and prophetic events that are mentioned in the scriptures. But I'm not looking for him. I'm looking for Jesus Christ to come and to take me to be with him. Thus, chapter 12, the burden of the word of the Lord of Israel. Now... In chapter 12, we come into the present time in which we are living right now. These prophecies are being fulfilled in our lifetime. They are already happening, have happened, and we're right. We've now caught up, finally. Uh, in the last chapter, we were with the crucifixion of Jesus and all. Now we're right up to uh, date in chapter 12. And it's the burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretched forth the heavens, laid the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. This is the word of God. The God who stretched forth the heavens. The God who laid the foundations of the earth. The God who puts spirit, his spirit, the spirit of of man within him. Behold, he said, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Israel is again a nation. They are dwelling in the land that God had promised unto their father Abraham. 
The moment Israel was declared a nation, May 14, 1948, Syria attacked from the north, Jordan from the uh, east, and Egypt from the south. And before the nation actually took almost its first breath, it found itself in a struggle for life, for survival, because the Arab nations were determined that the nation of Israel would not exist in that territory that was assigned to them by the UN resolution. But, as we know, though Jordan took the West Bank and though Egypt took the Sinai, and though Syria conquered the Golan Heights, the Jews held on to enough territory to establish a nation. Now, in 1967, again Syria, Jordan, and Egypt decided that they would destroy this new nation. Nasser was armed by Russia as well as Syria and Jordan and they had planned to exterminate Israel in 1967. They ordered the UN troops out as Nasser announced his intentions of attacking and taking Jerusalem. But the Lord again was with Israel and in six days the Jews took the Sinai Peninsula from Egypt. They took the West Bank from Jordan and for the first time Jerusalem became a united city uh, after almost 2,000 years. It used to be when you visited Israel when you went to Jerusalem you'd have to go through what they called the no man's land. You'd have to walk a block through this area uh, to go from the West Bank area into the uh, Jerusalem quarters. But, Jer but the whole city of Jerusalem, actually the West Bank was taken from Jordan and the Golan Heights was conquered from Syria. In 1973, again, they designed what they called the War of extermination. It has now been called the Yom Kippur War. And again they attacked Israel. Uh, this time on two fronts. Jordan did not enter. They learned their lesson in the first two encounters. But now Egypt and Syria attacked in surprise attacks on Yom Kippur and they nearly accomplished their goals of exterminating Israel. But once again, the hand of God and many miracles, um, Israel was spared. Not only were they spared, once they uh, began their counterattack, they took back all of the Sinai Peninsula that was taken by the Egyptians, but then they went on into Israel Egypt and they trapped the whole third Egyptian army uh, and up on the Golan they took back the Golan Heights from Syria that had moved within view of the uh, Sea of Galilee and they took back the Golan and they were pushing and had come within 17 miles of Damascus when uh, both Egypt and Syria called for a ceasefire and that was when Kissinger did his little shuttle diplomacy and uh, brought Israel to the peace table uh, to uh, cease their uh, war. Otherwise, Sharon was begging to uh, go on to capture Cairo to teach the Egyptians a lesson. And uh, they were uh, ready to start a bombardment of uh, Damascus with their artillery uh, which has a range of 17 miles and they were setting up the artillery and were going to bombard. They weren't going to try and take Damascus. 
uh, they felt that it wasn't worth it in the cost of lives, but they were going to punish Damascus, teach them a real lesson, and just give them a real artillery bombardment. But uh, that was stopped uh, as a result of the uh, shuttle uh, diplomacy under Kissinger, and uh, thus the uh, Jews were robbed of a real victory, complete victory at that time. And so we see how Jerusalem became a cup of trembling under the people that were round about. Now this is not yet completely fulfilled. There is going to be a confederacy of nations that will come against Israel and against Jerusalem once again. Uh, in this confederacy of nation, uh, a, a part of the Russian troops will be involved. Uh, the uh, Iranian troops will be involved. The Libyan forces will be involved, uh, as well as Turkey. And uh, this will be more or less that fulfillment of all the people of the earth be gathered, though they all, it doesn't say they all will, but even though they all, this vast uh, alliance of nations that will come against it. But in that day, when this battle takes place, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness. And I will open my eyes upon the house of Judah, and I will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in the Lord of hosts their God. They, they will turn to God for their strength. Now as Ezekiel describes this battle in chapter 38 and 39 and how God intervenes and gives Israel a complete victory over these opposing forces, God declares that in that day he will pour out his spirit upon the nation of Israel. And they will again... Uh, recognize that he is God. So, in that day I will make the governors of Judah like a hearth, a hearth of fire among the wood, and like a torch of fire in the sheaf, and they shall devour all the people round about on the right hand, on the left, and Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. The Lord also will save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. And in that day, notice in that day, in that day, this is the day when, when God brings them that great victory over these uh, opposing forces. In that day, the Lord shall defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David. And, of course, we know the, the tremendous feats of David in battle. And the least of them like David. And uh, the house of David shall be as God and the angel of the Lord before them. As God steps in once more into history to defend his people, Israel, uh, against this invading army. It shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all of the nations that come against Jerusalem. God's judgment will come against these nations that have attacked Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. When this is all completed, the battle, the battle against the combined forces that will come with Russia, and then later the forces of the Antichrist and the battle of Armageddon, Jesus will return according to, uh, we'll get it next week, the 14th chapter, and set his foot upon uh, the Mount of Olives. And... Um, God will give to them the spirit of grace and supplication and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. 
here as the prophecy that refers to the cross of Jesus Christ where in Psalm 22, a thousand years before Jesus was crucified, the psalmist prophesying the crucifixion said, they have pierced my hands and my feet. Here in Zechariah, 400 years before Jesus, actually 500 years before Jesus, about 487 B.C., Zechariah declares, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. When Jesus comes again in glory to establish his reign over the earth, um, Revelation, the book of Revelation chapter 1 tells us about it. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all of the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. There will be a great consternation among the people because they will realize that for all of these years, they have rejected God's true Messiah. Their eyes will be open. But God, rather than saying, well, you know, now we'll deal with you, is graceful, forgives them. Why is it that we always seem to imagine God being angry with us, upset with us, ready to deal harshly with us. God is so gracious. God is so merciful. God is so loving. He is constantly looking for excuses not to punish you. Constantly looking for excuses to forgive you, to cleanse you, to pardon you, to show his mercy and grace. For God delights, it says, in mercy. Oh, how he just delights to be merciful to you and to show his mercy to you. And yet, Satan has so lied to us about the nature of God and character of God that we constantly think that God is angry and just ready to really punish us. Not so. And here are these people, after all these years of rejection, God puts upon them the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn. They're going to wail. They will mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. Their mourning will be like the, that of a parent who lost their only son. And they shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. The great sorrow and grief of these people in realizing what they have lost and what their ancestry has lost because of their rejection of Jesus Christ, the true Messiah. In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the morning of uh, had it rimmon in the valley of Megiddo, and the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Levi apart, their wives apart, the family of Shimei apart, and their wives apart, and all of the families that remain, every family apart and their wives apart. The great mourning of these people as they finally wake up and realize the blindness and what that blindness has cost them in suffering and in misery through the years. As Jesus said when he came into Jerusalem, if only you knew the things that belong to your peace in this thy day. If you only knew the blessings, if you only knew what God would do for you and what God is wanting to do for you. And he wept because of their blindness, because it was going to be so costly to them. 
And I think that as Jesus looks at us many times, he weeps over our blindness and how costly our blindness is. If you only knew what God wanted to do for you, if you only knew what God would do for you, if you would just surrender and yield your life fully and completely unto him, if you only knew the things that belong to your peace. But, God's, but the Lord said to, to Jerusalem, but they are hid from your eyes, and the days are going to come when the troops are going to set siege against the city and your little children are going to be dashed in the streets and he wept as he saw the calamities that were going to befall them because they had chosen the wrong path and the Lord looks at your life today and he seeks to put you on the right path and some of you are on a path that's going to lead to heartache and destruction to misery and the Lord weeps as he sees you taking that path. He calls you to the right way. He calls you to repentance. He calls you to turn. Because he can see the disastrous consequences that will happen as the result of your actions and the path that you have chosen. Hear the voice of the Lord. Respond to the voice of the Lord. Turn from the life of the flesh. It can only bring misery. Live and walk after the spirit that you might have and know the life of God and fellowship with God. So we pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, for your love, for your mercy and for your grace. Lord, you have not rewarded us according to our iniquities. But as the heavens are high above the earth, so high is your mercy toward those that fear you. May we walk, Lord, in reverence and awe of your greatness, of your power, and may we walk in obedience to your commands, surrendering and yielding, Lord, our lives to you, that we might be filled with your spirit and that we might be your servants, accomplishing your will, being a light to this dark world and salt to a rotting society. Make us, Lord, what you would have us to be. Empower us with your spirit that we might go forth as a mighty army against the world that is bound in sin, bringing, Lord, the glorious message of salvation, of hope through Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the 